located. Sires and Waiting were boarded on a farm near Union Hill, and progeny herds were housed on a farm southwest of New Prague. MVBA became internationally recognized as a, pioneer, a pioneering authority on artificial insemination. Kind of to go along with that, liquid nitrogen cryogenic tanks replaced ice chests in 1960 for preserving bull semen. And the first cryogenic tanks were made in the Miller family garage and later manufactured by Minnesota Valley Engineering, begun by Joe Schuster and Bill Miller. The city of New Prague is fortunate to have these two businesses in its history. With that being said, I'm proud to present Hala Schwartz, our guest speaker. And not only is, is Hollis a very knowledgeable person, Hollis is still delivering meals on wheels. And I couldn't respect him more for that. And thank you, Hollis. Thank you. And let, let me know if you can hear Hollis okay. Thank you for the introduction, Fred. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because... I hate to be at a meeting where you can't hear someone, even if you want to get away. Uh, it's still all right. Thanks again for that introduction, and I am definitely excited and enthused to be here again in New Prague. I've never lived here. I lived in Tasca all the years that I, that I worked. The way I got here was kind of a hook and crook. Uh, I got a phone call from a lady, I think her name is Franny, and I think she's here tonight, that someone had called her about some bulls being destroyed in a fire. And they didn't know when that happened, and they inquired. And so she looked it up, and of course it's 1957. Uh, yeah, is it working? It's 1957, and, oh dear. Hello. Okay. All right. I'm getting started. All right. Anyway, she thought of my name, and she gave me a call. And she said she was a member of the New Prig area, uh, Historical Society and would like to talk to me sometime. So we met in her house. She lives in Lesur County. She's on the south side of Main Street. So we met in there and then a little later I had another meeting and I met a Mr. Dennis Dvorak and uh, Fred and uh, a few others. And they did some recording and so forth and they're starting to have a really good time. And finally, Franny or somebody said, we're going to have a meeting on April 6th would you like to talk? And I said, yes. And oh my God, I didn't realize what I was biting off here. But here I am, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a truly a pleasure for me to be here because I enjoyed working for Minnesota Valley Breeders for 38 years. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm almost at home. I was born in a little corner farmhouse about 12 miles from here in Sharon Township, Section 16, Lesseur County. My father was born about a mile and a half away in 1898, but uh, he, that's all the further he moved. My mother was born in Henderson on Highway 19, just west of town. Adolf Schwartz and Frieda Schrupp. That does not make me check. <laughs> the, the names like that. So here I am tonight, and I'm going to review uh, things that would add on to the wonderful calm that was written in the uh, New Prague paper by, what's his name? He's sitting here somewhere. Yeah. He wrote about a history display in Minnesota Valley Breeders Association. And it's a pretty accurate uh, accounting. I was pretty pleased to see what was there. 
But he put a, a sentence in there that says this. Dennis Dvorak of the Historical Society said the reason they decided to do this exhibit was there are people who have moved to town since the business closed. Are there some that have moved to town since? <laughs> Seriously. That's who I'm here to talk about. The rest of you guys, and I've met a bunch of you tonight, know me by name and you know what I did and didn't do and all that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the past, about the past to get you up to date. As I said, I was born in Lesseur County, uh, went to a country school with, with 16 kids and I was alone in my grade for eight years. I, I was a valedictorian of that class. Uh, and, and I think had a great time. Uh, I then went to, to Lesseur High School. I started driving when I was 14. I turned 15 in October. So I drove the next three years. There were no school buses at Lesseur at that time. So we had to use the family car uh, to get back and forth. I drove in the 1940 blizzard uh, from the high school. I got through high school and uh, then went back out on the farm with dad for a year or two. And then one day he got a call, loaded me up, took me to Lee Center, got on a bus with a bunch of other men. We went to Fort Snelling, got sworn into the military for the tail end of World War II. Spent the last nine months of the war as a veteran going from the, to the Philippine Islands and uh, getting very lucky. I'm going to interject something here about me personally. I'm probably one of the luckiest guys walking on two legs anywhere. Uh, I just, things turn my way. I'm almost always at the right place at the right time when there's an opportunity. Way beyond what I could plan for. And I've just been really damn lucky through all these years. So it's going to come up a couple times. One of them was when I was in the Philippines ready to join a group to invade Japan, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer and Harry Truman had some bombs and dropped them on Honshu, and that kind of ended that war. I didn't have to invade Japan. <laughs> Is that a good move? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I got discharged in 1946. 19, neighborhood, we had a couple people named Harold and Helen Von Lee. They were mentors, they were U of M grads. And Harold said to me, why don't you check with the University of Minnesota? You're eligible for the GI Bill. Oh, I said, I'm just a darn ordinary student. I didn't do so good in school. I had no competition. So, well anyway, I did register the fall of 1948 at the U of M and got accepted. I did get through the four years at the U of M and a couple of interesting things happened while I was in those four years. I'm going to recount those. I'll get to Men Valley in a minute. Just to listen, listen about me. And there was uh, 60 of us lived in a dormitory. Half of them were World War II vets. And uh, we had one telephone in the lobby for all 60 people. And, uh, one of the guys had a sister on the main campus in the Cadet Nurse Corps for World War II. And they had put on dances to meet with us guys from Old Home Dorm. And we were going to go down to the Union on the, on the campus. And of course, uh, there was another guy, a, a uh, student from the main campus, who was an athlete. He played football, baseball, and basketball. And we all knew his name. And his name was, and still is, Bud Grant. Oh, yes. is, Bud is only a couple years younger than I am, so uh, uh, he was courting a girl out there, and that's where we saw him. The other event then is I, I did find a nurse at that party, and uh, I met her tomorrow, it'll be 74 years ago that I met her uh, in, Mar in April. We, uh, did it for a couple of years and in between junior and senior year at the U. Uh, we were married and uh, we were married for 67 years. She's on her way now and I'm alone, but 
we had a great time uh, through those years. My son is sitting back there, uh, one of my from one of my family. After I graduated from the U of M, Patsy and I enjoyed mountain skiing in the Rocky Mountains because she had worked at Denver General. So we got in our brand new 1951 Chevrolet and drove to Denver and she got a job in Denver General and I tried to sell farm machinery because I had a, a minor in ag engineering. And uh, we were not doing good. The company I worked for was owned by some Mormons and I knew I was going nowhere in that company. She was paid all over $190 a month as an RN, you know. So we were thinking of coming back to Minnesota, so we came on vacation in the end of October of 1952. Uh, and on the way back, Patsy and I were talking, and I said, you know, we talked about Minnesota Valley when I was taking classes in the University of Minnesota in the Animal Science Department. I worked with a little dairy herd that was on the campus, mind you. I think there were 20 Holsteins on that campus at the U. They had a milk truck and I worked on the milk truck. You still got my coverall, haven't you, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, I've got a coverall there. In the spring, we would deliver milk to the dormitories and we discovered if you shut the motor off on the, on the truck, close into the backyard, some of the co-eds are sunbathing in, in the spring. <laughs> so there were fringe benefits in that. <laughs> anyway, we got back to Chas, to uh, my folks in Lesore County and I said, I'm gonna drive over to New Prague because I hear that there's a bull stud operating over there and I wanna talk and get to know the manager. So I drove over here on Highway 21 and in the old Scott County Fair buildings, Wally Miller and I think Irv Steinoff, have I got the name right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And a couple other guys were working with some bulls that they had on the east side of 21. And we sat down and talked for a while and we got introduced and I told Wally Miller, I think I'm coming back to Minnesota. Is there a possibility I could work for Minnesota Valley Breeders? He says, yes, we're enlarging greatly. In fact, uh, 1952, we uh, had 212,000 631 first services by 156 technicians. Imagine that back in 1952. This little book incidentally was made by uh, Wally Miller, uh, Wally, uh, Siri. Siri. yeah, the, the, the manager. And uh, he, uh, was, was collecting more boats. Anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought here for a second. Uh, he um, said, uh, we can put you in a place very shortly to start inseminating cows. I said, no, Patsy and I wanna, we wanna ski the winter yet uh, and then come back in the spring. And so we got in the car, went back to the end of our vacation and we were hardly in the apartment a day and the phone rang. Wally Miller is on the phone. Hey, he says, Hollis, we got a place for you on uh, near the uh, Iowa border in a little town south of, uh, what's that big town down there? Yeah. Anyway, we can start you there as soon as you're trained. Well, I said, I'd, I'd kind of like that, but I don't have enough money to move back to Minnesota. Well, he says, I got a technician here and a guy with a big truck. If I sent him out there to move you back and no charge to you, would you come back? I looked at Pat and I said, yeah. So by the end of October, Patsy and I are back in Lesur County with my father. I drove to New Prague, met Wally Miller, and I, again, I'm a lucky guy where good things happen to me. They're not gonna open that unit at Emmons, Minnesota on the Iowa border. Instead, there's a technician in Carver County. His name is Tony Zweber from New Market. You guys heard of New Market, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got a brother sitting in here. But 
uh, Tony had done a great job. The business grew rapidly. Min Valley was going rapidly. They were going to split a piece of that unit off, give it to me, and I was going to move into Cologne. Tony was going to move into Chaska. Tony just married a lovely lady named Martha. And he was anticipating a large family uh, of kids, but he couldn't find a big house in Chaska. So he stayed in Cologne and I went to Chaska, which was ideal because they only had a parochial school in, in Cologne. So I came back and then drove to New Prague and met Wally Miller. And guess who he introduced me to? A big burly guy from the Iron Range, Aurora. His name was Pete Milinkovich. <laughs> Anybody ever hear of Pete Milinkovich? Yeah, I think so. Pete was very close to the manager, worked close in a number of positions. His chief job, of course, was sire analyst. And Pete was outstanding. He had been at it for some time. Minnesota Valley had been functioning through the 40s and we're getting into the 50s now. And he arranged for training for me to learn how to inseminate cows. And it takes a couple of weeks. And he got me out there and in the meantime, I bumped into a t county agent and he says, I hear you're going to breed cows in Carver County. I said, yeah. He said, you're a lucky guy. Car Carver County is known as the golden buckle of the Minnesota Dairy Belt. Has more cows per square mile than any county in the state of Minnesota. Guess where I'm going for my first job, where the most <laughs> doggone cows are. Okay, uh, and so I got, I got my training and uh, started breeding, breeding cattle there and we were very successful. Place grew rapidly. Uh, the number of breedings grew well. I had wonderful dairymen on eastern Carver County stretching all the way up to Excelsior on the south shore of Lake uh, Minnetonka near, uh, what's that? city up there. Wazetta? Wazetta and... Uh, yeah. Anyway, there was a bunch of people lived in that little houses along Lake Minnetonka, but they worked in the suburbs of Minneapolis. But when they came home, they came to two acres with a big garden, chicken coop and a couple pigs in a pen, and two or three cows. They were so excited that they could get a technician to come out and breed those two or three cows, they didn't need to buy a bull. They didn't need to be home to take care of the breeding, all of those details. And they loved MVBA and gave us a lot of publicity, which was wonderful. My, my townships, so in eastern Carver County, they were from Carver, East Union, uh, Wacon not quite to Waconia. We operated on telephone exchanges because there was only one phone in a house and there was no recording, there was no nothing and then I made a slave out of my wife. She had to remain in the house to answer the phone in the morning until noon to take calls from farmers who had cows in estrus. You people know about those things, I think. I know a lot of you do and are familiar with it. So then I got half a schedule to go out and, and, breed, and breed those cattle. The business grew good. We had some, mostly Germans, a few Dutchmen, some uh, Scandinavians down around East, East Union who helped found Gustavus Adolphus, by the way. My business had grossed. It really went well. I had help from cooperative farmers. They taught me and I taught them and by golly, everything was working. I was having fun because I grew up on a farm. We had no electricity. I knew how to milk cows by hand. So I was, I was familiar with that. Alice, how about a drink of water? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You wanted water. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I, I did want that. So in a matter of just a few years, less than five years, I tripled the business. I shouldn't say I, we did, Minnesota Valley. I had immense cooperation from the people right here in New Prague. 
I didn't know much about New Prague community or who lived here or what they did and how well they could work, but I began to discover some pretty darn solid, smart people who were dependable and cared for the community, worked well together, even though some were German and, Czech, and some were Czech, but it, it worked. The business grew rapidly, and in a short time, uh, as I said, I tripled the business, and after, see, I started in 52, and in 50, got to get a schedule here. Oh, I got it here. Uh, I became a field supervisor in 1959. Job I hated. Uh, I was put in charge of 28 other technicians in an area to help them increase their business, keep them satisfied. But I know there's people in this group out here who supervised large groups, and sometimes you spend your time with a few percentage and they neglect the rest, and that was my case. I had some guys that were drinking, another one that was absconding money, had to get them fired, and that meant then I had to find someone to replace them, train them, et cetera, et cetera. But I worked on that and worked on that, and it, it uh, was pretty good, but a new thing was occurring, and we were getting to be around the time of 1961. In 1961, there was a massive change in the AI industry nationally, not just New Prague. We had been breeding cows with liquid semen for the 40s, after Wally uh, started the place and a good part of the 50s, hot semen, we called it, liquid egg yolk citrate extender delivered by an army. Was there anyone in this crowd who, who drove a delivery truck getting the semen out to technicians? You got a few hands? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Four times a week, they went out with semen to these men, and in the box was an ice can and about 10 little tubes that contained semen from three Holsteins, two Guernseys, a Jersey, Brown Swiss, Shorthorn, Angus, and a Hereford. And that was only good for two days. It was delivered on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Can you imagine vehicles going out, getting boxes, little cardboard boxes with a little freezer thing and an ice can, delivering that to those people seven, four times a week, every week of the year. They had to have it to breed cows. What an operation it was. It, it was cumbersome. There were problems, vehicles, and not only that, it was expensive. So now we're about to take on the advantage of a man named Christopher, Dr. Christopher Polds of London, England, who in 1950s found the cryoprotective agent to protect sperm cells so that you could freeze them, store them, thaw them out, and breed cows. And they were successful. Wow, that kept enlarging. And I learned a little bit about that in the animal science department when I was at the U of M. I, would, I did know something about it. That, pro, that method got worked on for a while, but you know, they has to be frozen and remain frozen as close to 100 below as possible to be fertile. They do that. So there's some problems. You can see a rising here. What kind of a container are you gonna put those ampules in? We also changed from liquid semen in a tube to a glass ampule that the medicinal business used for drugs and so forth for many, many years. I bought a machine from England to put Am, uh, semen in ampules. By the way, I'm now in the lab. I, Wally Miller said, Hollis, you're a, you're a uh, detailed person that can usually figure some of these things out. Why don't you be a lab manager? And finally, after 10 years with Min Valley, I got in the job I loved. 
something I enjoyed. I like to weigh things, measure things, take the temperature, make a record of it, blah, 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 things like that. Guys like, like Jim Becker and uh, uh, Harry Von Bank, they know that well because we work shoulder to shoulder day after day for years and years. Right, Jim? Right. Yes, okay. They knew what I was doing and they were very good helpers, dependable, intelligent, and I could count on them all the time. So about that time, one of Wally Miller's daughters married a guy from the Iron Range named Joe Schuster. Anyone here of Joe Schuster? <laughs> yeah, okay. Joe Schuster was an outstanding chemical engineer. Worked up in the Iron Range, I don't know in what capacity, but he was smart. He came down to New Prague and he noticed that Minnesota Valley had bought a couple of cryogenic containers from, oh God, I forgot the name of the company. Uh, who manufactured those first ones? Cryanko. Cryanko, yes. We bought some of those to get started to store the frozen semen in liquid nitrogen at minus 320 Fahrenheit, 196 Celsius. Celsius. We were making progress. Wally and, and uh, Schuster said, you know, these darn cry cryogenic tanks cost over $500 a piece. How many Texans, technicians did I say we had? 156. Do a little multiplying there, guys. See, this is money. And if you knew Wally Miller as I knew Wally Miller, he wanted to save some money. And, and I don't discredit him for that. That's a good, that's a good sense. It, it worked. So he says, I think we can make cryogenic containers right here in New Prague. And sure enough, uh, Schuster comes out, he gets some welders, gets some good stainless steel, makes cryogenic containers. They need to be insulated and heated and wrapped. And the first one's for evacuated in his garage, which is across the street from Franny's house. She's in Lesur County. Wally was on Scott County across the street. <laughs> there must be a very high efficiency of evacuation because what you're making is a stainless steel thermos jug that will last with 20 liters in it for four weeks. Is that about the right number? Yeah, okay. The early ones were a little problem. We lost thousands of amples of semen through faulty tanks. However, we saved a darn lot of money by having the tanks manufactured by a new business, Minnesota Valley Engineering. And they started working and new Prague employees are coming in left and right. And uh, I kind of got to start to know some of those people because I was now in the lab. I was commuting to New Prague. And I got to know merchants. Hard, who was that hardware man on the corner on Main Street? Uh, Rindus. Rindus. Rindus Hardware, this is one of them. And I knew a lot of them. They were, they were good. Some of them made good kolotchkis, you know, <laughs> among, among other things. We enlarged and we started making ampules of frozen semen in the storage. My first storage unit was a tall one like this that cost thousands of dollars. I was able to get some and they're pictured on, on the table back there somewhere about uh, these containers. And they're very efficient. But then the air products companies say, hey, the AI industry nationwide needs liquid nitrogen. What happens when something is in great demand? The price goes up. Wally Miller pops out again. It's costing us lots of money. What are we going to do? He got a hold of Joe Schuster again, and they purchased a used liquid nitrogen plant. And that was built, erected just probably 30 feet, I think, from the bull barn. Don't you, Jim? The, the location right in there. There was a big storage tank in there. And I hired a man from Shakopee named Stan Brooks. He had operated a liquid nitrogen plant on an aircraft carrier to produce oxygen for the pilots. And he was qualified. 
he ran the plant and and then Wally says, Hollis, you managed that plant. I didn't need that. I didn't get a raise for it either. You know. But anyway, uh, I worked on that. But it was effective. It did stabilize the price of, elect, of uh, the, the liquid nitrogen nationally. So we benefited many other com countries. I'm beginning now to learn the importance of Minnesota Valley breeders. And I credit you people for helping MVE and MVBA develop because you are versatile. I take like Harry Von Bank. Harry worked with me and you know, the guy could do anything and I could depend on him day after day after day. He was hardworking, he knew how to take directions and he's just one example. And I was always surrounded by very competent people in the whole uh, MVBA. I'm so damn proud to have worked for them. For, I'm gonna cite a reason. The reason is that I'm so proud is we were helping people. Minnesota Valley made better cattle on thousands of farms. Can you imagine that? Increased the genetic background of those cattle. They produced more milk. We helped people. And you people in New Prague helped all of us. We worked together. And I always enjoyed driving to work in the morning uh, because I was going to go down with a gang of people that I got along with and had, had fun with. This kept growing, but there was another change. We had the semen in ampules, glass ampules. The earliest refrigeration was a chunk of dry ice in, in uh, isopropyl alcohol. That was before we got the liquid nitrogen. It was only uh, about 115, minus 115. It kept the semen, I think maybe I mentioned that. Anyway, but liquid nitrogen was far superior because what we're sitting and breathing in this room is 80% nitrogen. And we're living, you know. So it, it's not a dangerous substance to be near and have in your, la in your laboratory. Okay, the company is increasing and we're getting visitors left and right. I've got a stack of cards on my desk at home in Chaska. It's got names of representatives from every country in the world that had milk cows. I can't read them because many are in foreign language on the backside. But they came to Minnesota Valley. They wanted to see a young sire project. They wanted to see a milking herd of what, 150 cows? Is that what we had out there? Pardon? Yes. Yeah, 150 cows proving. Uh, he's looking for somebody there. Anyway. Oh, yes. No, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> 